So we're going to take a look at profiling and police perceptions of profiling. Now, there's a few important things that we really need to begin with and to define before we can start to answer whether police actually perceive profiling to be successful or not. And the first thing really is going back to the idea as a profiler around who is your client. And ultimately, in most cases of offender profiling, your client or your customer is the police or the detectives that are working the case. So it's very important for the profiler to be clear on that. Now, in addition to police, for example, in some areas, such as if you're in America, for example, and you're conducting a profile, it can also be the use of profiling in terms of a crime scene analysis. So that might be in the case where a person has been charged and then your client really becomes either the attorney who has hired you or alternatively the court. So in those different processes, the, the approach to profiling, while likely to be quite similar, may also be in different contexts and there might also be different needs for the client and the profiler really needs to make sure that they're aware of those and strives to meet those in their profile. Now, we need to also be mindful of what services can a profiler actually offer. So firstly, we need to know obviously who our clients are, then we need to look at whether the profiler can provide the services that the client's requesting and can they also meet the expectation of the client and meet the client's need based on the services that they are able to provide. So let's go back to the basics of profiling and where everything fits and we've got two phases to profiling. So we have the investigative phase, which really is the most common known approach to profiling. So that's really profiling being applied to an active case. And then we have the trial phase, which is not as common in Australia, but it's more prominent in America where profilers are involved in cases where someone has been charged. Now, in the investigative phase, this is really when profilers are assisting during the active investigation. Now, the main aim is to evaluate the forensic and behavioural evidence of that crime. So, we're looking at a crime scene analysis and potentially also the crime scene reconstruction. One of the primary aims is to reduce the suspect pool and then to prioritise suspects. Another option as well is looking at doing a linkage analysis. So that's based on our crime scene analysis and then looking at whether there's evidence such as through MO or signature behaviour to suggest that maybe there's a commonality across cases. As well, looking at the assessment for potential escalation in either the seriousness of the offending or the potential harm that may arise from that offending. Another aspect as well is to provide investigative leads and strategies. So how may the investigation go about trying to target the potential suspect based on key recommendations in the profile? And of course, also to develop interview and interrogation strategies. So based on what the profile's analysis of that case has been, how might they go about interviewing or interrogating the suspect? Now, the second phase of where profiling can be used is the trial phase. Now, as I was saying before, in this stage, the profiler is involved in the case to evaluate the forensic and behavioural evidence of the crime. And this is when a suspect has been charged. So it involves reviewing the nature of forensic and behavioural evidence, so very similar to the investigative phase. 
Then the idea is about developing insight into motivations or whether there's any underlying fantasy component in the offending. Also determining a range of factors such as during or after crime behaviour. Other things such as looking at intent, motive and even maybe evidence of precautionary acts. Again, linkage analysis to other possible crimes is also a feature of this along with providing expert evidence in the court if it is accepted by the court. So they are the services that the profiler can provide. Now, the other side of the coin is to understand what police are wanting from profilers. And there was a good study conducted by Cole and Brown in 2011 where they interviewed 11 senior investigative officers in the UK. Now, these police officers had at least 20 years investigative experience and they'd also used profiles in some of their cases. Now, it was quite interesting in terms of what the police actually wanted and it's there's a number of things that we can take away from this. But firstly, some of the criteria that police listed were they wanted to know the relationship of the offender to the victim. They wanted to know the age of the offender. They wanted to know about the ethnicity or ethnic appearance of the offender, which is something that I think profilers would want to be very cautious about because unless there was evidence on that, that would really be a concern that a profiler would be starting to guess the potential race or ethnicity of a potential perpetrator. They also wanted to know the previous criminal history of an offender. Now, that might be something that a profiler could talk to, but again, that would be looking at factors such as potential criminal sophistication. Also, the living circumstances of the offender. Now, that is potentially something that I think a profiler would need to tread very carefully around. Other factors such as education and employment, again, we're starting to get a little bit more removed from the evidence and there would need to be information which would suggest why the profiler is making an inference about the person's education or employment. Police also wanted to know the offender's possible hobbies, their sociability, their aspirations, their family background, their possible medical conditions, their general lifestyle. So we're seeing that in all of these really personal details that police are wanting, they are factors that could really stretch a profiler. And it could really weaken a profile if the if the professional or the practitioner included some of these in a profile. Police also wanted to know things such as access to weapons, whether the individual had any specialist knowledge, skills or training. Now that's something that a profiler could include in their profile, particularly if the crime scene behaviour suggests some form of specialised knowledge. Another factor as well, such as do they abuse their wife, I think we would really caution that being used in a profile. Um, It would be very speculative. There'd have to be something that suggested that there was some sort of pattern or behaviour that indicated that this was a common occurring behaviour by the offender. Do they have children or pets? Or ultimately, they wanted to know, the police wanted to know whether really just any general background information on the person. So we can really see that some of the things that police wanted in a profile are actually very unrealistic of a profiler. And if the profiler were to provide these, then they would be jeopardising the case quite significantly. So making predictions about pets or or even ethnic appearance without any distinct evidence would be very problematic and surely likely to lead to confusion or even mislead the investigation. So in many ways, these findings highlight the need for profilers to be clear 
on their professional limitations, particularly in regard to what they can provide in a profile. But there is also then the onus on the profiler to help investigators understand how the information that they have provided in a profile can be actioned and how it can be useful to investigators. So there's no doubt that this collaboration is important to the utility of a profile. So we can see that there's, there's certainly somewhat of a mismatch between what profilers should be providing in a profile versus what police are expecting. Now, there has also been some really interesting studies over the years looking at the accuracy of profiles that have been provided to police, the satisfaction of police officers with these profiles, but also, more importantly, the utility of these profiles that they have received. So looking at some of this research is, is important to understanding how police view the success and the outcome of profiles that they receive. And one of the first ever studies published on the effectiveness of profiling in police investigations was conducted by Anthony Pinizzotto in 1984 in collaboration with the FBI. Now, according to Pinizzotto, nearly 80% of the responding officers believed that the profile that they received helped focus the investigation. Another 20% stated that it helped locate suspects. 17% of officers claim that it helped to actually identify the actual suspect, while 5.6% claimed that it ultimately assisted in the conviction of the offender. But 17% of respondents also advised that the profile was actually of no assistance to the investigation. Now, another study close to a, a decade later, was conducted in 1993 by Jackson and colleagues in the Netherlands. And this study examined the advice that was provided to, to police officers in the Netherlands by one of their own officers that had been trained in the FBI profiling methods. And in the study, they looked at the advice that that officer or that profiler provided, and they'd offered advice in 42 instances, but only six profiles were provided to investigators. Now, obviously, there's only a limited number of profiles, profiles there for Jackson and colleagues to make conclusions from about the effectiveness of this profiler, but two of the profiles were judged by the officers as being positive, three as reasonably useful, and two of these as being unhelpful. Now, some of the reasons for these ratings included that the offender was apprehended due to chance, so therefore it was difficult to actually evaluate the profile. The profile fitted some of the characteristics, but not others. The profile failed to provide new investigative leads. The profile was, in fact, too general or vague, so the information contained within it really wasn't something that ultimately was practical or actionable or could be measured or worked with by the officers. So the study by Jackson and colleagues provided some insight into some of the issues experienced by the officers when receiving profiles. And certainly no doubt that is interesting and there's some important themes that we need to be mindful of when we're thinking about profiles. But there's also another interesting study that's arguably one of the most notable studies on profiling and it does build upon some of this earlier research around police perceptions of profiling, and it's the 1995 paper by Copson. Now, Copson investigated whether profiles pro provided 
were actually useful and satisfied the needs of investigation of investigators. So 180 feet, 184 profiles were provided to police officers in the UK between 1981 and 1994. And approximately 83% of responding officers found that profilers that the profiles that they received were actually operationally useful and that 92% of the officers reported that they would use criminal profiling again. So some really high statistics that suggest that the officers were quite happy with the profiles that they received. Now, 60% of officers reported that profiles assisted in promoting their understanding of the investigation. And 50% stated that the profiles also reassured their own judgments about the case. So if anything, the profiles actually served to just reaffirm their confidence that they were on the right track in the case. However, only 2.7% of officers actually believe that the profile helped them to identify the perpetrator. So really quite low findings when we think about an actual specific outcome but high findings when we think about whether it actually was beneficial or assisted officers. Now, the authors concluded ultimately that the profiles assisted with focusing the investigation, prioritising suspects, saving or reducing time in the case, generating new leads or new ideas, enhancing the understanding of the offender, so certainly shaping and putting some parameters around who the offender may be, along with providing a thorough overview of the investigation, so really conducting an analysis of the investigation to date and then providing recommendations around that. But the profiles didn't actually solve the case. So really the, the, the takeaway from this was that they were useful and quite useful, but there was a limit to where the utility of that profile stopped. And one of the criticisms though of Copson's research was that the findings really focused on police officers' satisfaction with profiling rather than understanding the nuances of the advice provided and also the effectiveness of that advice to the investigation. Well, one study that, that certainly has built on some of the limitations that were identified in the Copson research and provided really a, a greater insight into the nuances of profiles provided in investigations is the research by Snook, Taylor and Bennell, which was conducted in 2007. Now, the study by Snook and colleagues examined 51 Canadian police officers' experience with profiles, including their beliefs and also looking at the utility and the validity of received profiles. So the study used a semi-structured interview containing three sections. So the first section focused on the demographic information about the officers. The second section involved asking officers 17 questions regarding their beliefs about profiling, while the third section consisted of 14 questions regarding the personal experiences that they'd had with profiling and also profiles. So in terms of the findings that were found in regard to officer beliefs, 92% of profilers found that the profiles were actually quite valuable to the criminal investigation. And, and remarkably, 94% believed that the profiles 
actually helped in solving the case. So quite high with some of these initial beliefs that are reported by the officers. We then had that 84% of officers believed that the profiles or the profilers actually offered greater investigative understanding of the case. So there was certainly a richer amount of information that was provided to assist the investigation. But only 59% of police officers believed that the, that the profiles or the profilers used scientific techniques in developing the profile or reaching conclusions in their profile. And 51% of officers believed that profilers should actually be used regularly in criminal investigations. But probably most notably, 78% of police officers surveyed believed that there were risks of a profiler misdirecting an investigation. So quite high in terms of police officers' beliefs about profiles actually being really helpful. But on the flip side, there was also an acknowledgement by these officers that there was certainly some risks involved in using profilers and it could actually backfire in the case. Now, in terms of looking at the actual use and application of how profiling was used in cases, 55% of the cases where profiling was used actually related to homicide cases, while 38% of the usage was around sexual assault cases. Now, 14% of these profiles were requested in the very initial stages of the investigation, while 31% of profiles were used in the later stage of the investigation. Now, 86% of profiles contained characteristics of the offender, while 76% contained insight into the offender's behaviour, and 65% contained information on interviewing strategies, so things that the officers could actually use to then interview that suspect. 69% indicated that the profile was operationally useful and 74% of officers indicated that the profile was accurate in predicting offender characteristics. So, I mean, that's certainly quite high numbers if we're saying that there's really three quarters of the profiles were, were accurate in predicting offender characteristics, although we do need to acknowledge that there's still, you know, nearly a 25% error rate there where profiles weren't in fact accurate. And lastly, that 40% of, of the profiles or those surveyed indicated that the profiler's advice was important to solving the case. So we can certainly see that the, the findings by Snook and colleagues did provide certainly some promising findings in regard to criminal profiling. And the authors concluded that criminal profiling really, in many aspects, made a significant contribution to criminal investigations with profiles confirming the opinions of investigators or helping to actually narrow down and focus the investigation. However, while the findings were largely positive, the authors did acknowledge that police did perceive that there were risks associated with profiling. So that there was a possibility that really using profiles had the potential to, to mislead the investigation. So when we think about the risk of profiles misleading an investigation, and we really try and break this down 
the greatest issue really appears to lie in profilers making claims that that are not in fact substantiated so ultimately ultimately they're unsubstantiated claims and when we think about that we're saying that these they're making claims that are not really based on any real or concrete evidence and quite interestingly in in, a, in an earlier study conducted by Allison and colleagues in a 2003 pa paper they found that through examining a number of profiles approximately 80% of the 4,000 claims made across these profiles were in fact unsupported and they specified really the need for at least four criteria to be present in a profile. Now, the first one was the idea of grounding, where claims that were made in the profile needed to be supported by psychological knowledge. Then secondly, we had the idea of warrants. And warrants really referred to that referred to the idea that claims needed to be linked back to something specifically in the research. Then thirdly, we had the idea of veracity, where there needed to be clear probability or likelihood in regard to the claims actually occurring. So potentially some statistical reference back to the likelihood or probability of those claims. Then also, fourthly, the need for falsification. So, can claims be disproven or, in fact, tested? And I think the idea around some of these criteria being present in a profile is really important. We need to have parameters for profiles. And if we want police to perceive profiles in a positive light but more importantly for profiles actually to be something that's going to help investigations, then there needs to be ways to substantiate the claims that are made in profiles. And from a positive perspective, in the UK there's certainly been some really positive growth and progress in the area of offender profiling. And this has really been with a shift away from using the term offender profiling and instead looking at the role and the interaction between psychology and the services that psychology can offer to law enforcement by the development of behavioural investigative advice. And behavioural investigative advice has really emerged as the modernised version of offender profiling in the UK. Now, with behavioural investigative advice, we have behavioural investigative advisors that work within that field, and they primarily operate under the National Crime Agency in the UK and really perform many of the roles that are associated with offender profiling. But of course, it behavioural investigative advisors encompass the whole range of aspects that are often linked with offender profiling, but we often see that really one of the main things that offender profilers actually do is just provide profiles. We don't always see profilers providing this whole range of psychological tools, and often when profilers have it hasn't actually been evidence-based or practiced in form. So the idea is that behavioural investigative advisors provide these range of services to police in the UK, but there's parameters around how this occurs. And behavioural invest investigative advisors are often referred to as BIAs. So when we're talking about these individuals, we use the term BIAs, and BIAs are monitored by the National Policing Improvement Agency in the UK, which sets out requirements for all reports, 
So it ensures that the rationale behind advice that goes out to police officers is explicit and it's also clear. And in addition to this, we also have the Association of Police Officers, known as the as the ACPO. Now, the ACPO was set up in 2000, and it was really initially set up as a working group to support police officers. But one of the initial issues that was raised by the ACPO was that they had quite a number of concerns about profiling and particularly some of the claims that were made in profiles. And the, the, the work of the ACPO really has resulted in policies being implemented around profiles and how BIAs are actually allowed and permitted to go about conducting their work. The, the ACPO actually goes about auditing accredited BIAs each year. So there's certainly a level of accountability there for behavioural investigative advisors. And these audits typically examine a variety of factors, but some of the factors look at whether the report that's been provided by the BIA actually uses the agreed terms of reference does it include the BIA's qualifications and background? And does the report specify caveats? So part of this is coming back to these unsubstantiated claims. Now, is there caveats or limitations specified within the report or within the profile? Because in, in many profiles we've seen over the years, it's this document really without parameters that in many aspects it's an anything goes type of approach. So the the role of caveats is quite important to acknowledge where inferences stop, but also where they start as well, or where they start and where they stop. And one of the lingering issues though, that still isn't quite nailed down, even with the BIAs being audited, is the, the lingering issue of how the reasoning behind inferences or profiles is still made. So although there's certainly this really positive attempt by the Association of Chief Police Officers, we still don't have a clear agreement on the process to reach conclusions or determine inferences for profiles. And that's really been something that remains an ongoing issue moving forward for offender profiling, but even for behavioural investigative advice or behavioural investigative advisors. So really when when we, we try to sum up the relationship that police have with profiling, it it's a complex thing to understand, but probably the short conclusion would be that surprisingly it actually is largely positive and no doubt when we tend to receive feedback from officers that have used profiling resources and you know therefore or or may already have certain expectations and beliefs about these services but, but we still do nonetheless get feedback that that is saying that you know the profile is largely positive or useful to the investigation so although they might be using the services because they believe it already will have positive relationships or positive associations or they may be the officers that believe in the utility of profiles still the feedback is positive so they're not necessarily coming back and saying that, well, I had the belief that it would be useful and in fact it turned out not to be. We're still getting largely positive results. But there are some concerns in relation to profiles and particularly this idea about profiles misleading police officers and 
and also the investigation. And the exact nature of this is really something that requires closer analysis, particularly in the research and the critical review of profiling moving forward. So it's clear that profiles make unsubstantiated claims and they can be misleading for an investigation, certainly some types of profiles. And more importantly, it, it's the profiler's responsibility to be engaging in evidence-based practice. So we can't leave it up to the police officers to know whether claims in a profile are scientific or based on evidence. Police place trust in the profiler, and again, this comes back to matters such as ethics and professionalism, with profiling really needing to be governed by bodies that set standards for the work. So it's positive that we see that in the UK that our you know, behavioural investigative advisors have a level of accountability and that there's pro processes in place where their work is reviewed and analysed. But the next step really is to look at how inferences and claims are made in profiles and to make sure that the police are being provided with science and, of course, evidence-based conclusions. So for police, there's a lot at stake if the, if the profiler employs poor practice. But, of course, the implications as well for the discipline are also huge and, and obviously it's something that at, at times the discipline has really suffered from over the years when we're talking about poor practice. So there's certainly scope and positive feedback for profiles continuing to be used as a law enforcement and investigative tool and we find that police do value this are largely satisfied, but where things get a little bit more challenging is when we look at how effective the profile is and whether claims are substantiated. And ultimately, that is the greatest mission for profiling as a discipline moving forward is to continue to make sure that the work that is produced by profilers is within the parameters of profile of profilers, but of course also aims to meet the needs of our clients. And largely clients are going to always be law enforcement. And in some cases and in some jurisdictions, then the client might be attorneys or may in fact be the court. But largely the greatest utility of profiles has for many years been in police settings and that continues to be who the main client is and really for profilers that's got to be something that continues to be something that's always refined and we always seek to meet the need of our clients. Mm -hmm.